Our understanding of the spread of bloodborne viruses amongst injecting drug users has been gradually emerging over the last 20 years. And during that time, it's often been difficult to make sense of the studies that have been published. This training film has been commissioned by the National Treatment Agency to set out our current understanding of HIV and hepatitis C infection amongst injecting drug users and what we know about how best to prevent their spread. One of the most confusing aspects of the epidemics has been that when the test for HIV was developed in the early 1980s and again when the test for hepatitis C was developed in the 1990s, the first studies to be published showed very high levels of prevalence amongst some populations of injecting drug users. In the case of HIV, an early study from Edinburgh found that over 50% of injectors there had been infected with the virus. And we're going to start by looking back at that epidemic to find out why it happened and to see what lessons can be learned for the prevention of bloodborne virus spread today. Edinburgh has not learned to live with its ignominious title of AIDS capital of Europe. The widespread use of drugs in some areas of the city has led to an explosive spread of the infection. The sharing of needles to inject heroin and the consequent passing on of infected blood is the main way in which the virus can be spread. Edinburgh is really what kicked the panic in the UK. Our early intelligence about HIV didn't come from big surveillance studies but from a general practitioner in a family practice in Edinburgh. Injecting drug use wasn't considered to be a medical responsibility. It was a role for doctors because there were complications and there were serious sequelae from drug injecting. But treatment and rehabilitation was largely about you know, social work and um, communities and um, residential units and non-medical and non-prescribing. Roy's initial concerns for the health of injecting drug users was prompted by an outbreak of hepatitis B in the city. Everybody was concerned about hepatitis B in public health were concerned when they spotted figures going up and it was the local drug using population that was the people who were getting it. And that was the entry point for doing research and we took blood samples from these patients to check and we took follow-up blood samples to check that the hepatitis had resolved. So when the test for HIV was developed, Roy realised that these samples they'd stored during their studies on hepatitis B could be looked at to see if any of their patients had caught HIV. We were able to go back and pull out sometimes 10 or 15 samples on the same person over a period of years and test them and find out when they became infected, either with hepatitis B or HIV or both. In the laboratory, they identified a patient, they tested the most recent sample. If it was negative, then that was it. They just reported that as negative. If it was positive, they went into the lab and looked to see if they had a previous sample and they kept testing until they got a negative one. Because the blood samples had been collected, over some time, you can date almost to the month when the first HIV positive sample was found. Somewhere between 82 and 85, from perhaps one or two people being HIV positive, suddenly 50% were positive. So this is what set the alarm bells ringing. Here we were discovering untreated subclinical disease in a group of people who were young, who weren't gay men, who had sexual partners, who had children, a lot of whom were women. You know, so it was a different population. You know, this is a population that really hadn't been described before with HIV. The main thing we've shown in the study is that there's been a sudden rapid increase in the AIDS virus positivity in the group we've studied in Edinburgh, and that if that reflects what happens in the rest, rest of the city, there is a large number of positive people in, in Edinburgh. It's interesting to ask the question why the Edinburgh epidemic took off. One of the theories is that this was a fairly naive group of new injectors who didn't know much about protecting themselves. The common pattern of drug taking was to do it in groups and to do it sharing and sharing the same equipment and getting equipment was difficult. These were groups of young kids sharing needles and syringes sitting in stairwells of local authority housing blocks. So the networks were very intense. At that stage we started giving out injecting equipment um, but only in small quantities, you know, and it was a feeble response in the face of, you know, such a, a huge problem that we know now. The only person that really had more vision was a surgical supply shop in Bread Street in the centre of Edinburgh, who started selling injecting equipment to drug users. The police put pressure on them to stop them selling syringes, because that seemed like a good idea. Fewer syringes, fewer injectors. He went out of business um, around about September 82, which Interestingly, it's, a, it's a, a date that just resonates with, you know, with all sorts of other things. I mean, that was the time when 
you know, when we know that we got our first, e in retrospect, first AIDS positive case, HIV positive case, and we know that the epidemic of hepatitis peaked around about that time. The important message is that it's happened here and it could happen to them. The knowledge of this rapid spread of HIV amongst injecting drug users in Edinburgh created a real sense of urgency in the drugs field because it seemed entirely possible that the same was true of every major city. The UK government knew also similar results were coming from European countries. So this was when the thinking then started, how can we respond to HIV? A cabinet committee was established and Willie Whitelaw, the Deputy Prime Minister, chaired this cabinet committee. And they took ministers to Amsterdam and to San Francisco so they could see other, you know, situations. And they made some, you know, pretty bold decisions and one of them was that they would allow needle and syringe exchange. The issuing of clean needles to addicts may be controversial, but the report's author says the AIDS problem is a more serious one than drug abuse. It is a fairly controversial recommendation. Oh, certainly. But it's a very major problem. It's a very, very big step to, to go, to take, to go from the present position where we are simply saying to people, you must not take drugs, it is, it is illegal for a start, apart from anything else, it is dangerous, to a situation where, if you like, we're handing out clean needles. There's been criticism, there's been you know, people assessing the value of it, there's people sort of saying it's not working as well as it should do, all of which are true. But we've never gone back and it's, it's been progressively a policy that's been adopted. So after the successful evaluation, needle exchange was rolled out across the country and drug treatment, particularly substitute prescribing, was made much more widely available. From 86 to 88 through to 90, needle exchange scaled up within four or five years, probably a thousand or so. It's a very rapid expansion. The development of services in the aftermath of the Edinburgh HIV epidemic has meant that the conditions which occurred there with networks of injectors who didn't have access to needles and syringes or drug treatment hasn't been repeated. And the widespread infection of injectors with HIV has so far been prevented. But there has been a worrying increase in the number of injectors catching HIV and hepatitis C in recent years. And in order to understand why that's happening, we really have to look in detail at how and why people share injecting equipment. The way hepatitis C and HIV mostly are acquired among injecting drug users is through sharing with someone who's infected. It helps me to view syringe sharing as being driven possibly by four different drivers. First and foremost will be very high risk environments that we find in some of our larger cities whereby people are injecting in situations where they have a lack of control, where they're injecting outside, where they're rushing injections. We can view structural situations outside of those more obvious, highly vulnerable situations and look at situations in smaller communities where people are very reluctant to use needle syringe exchange programs because of fears of anonymity. Sometimes simple things like the attitudes of the counter staff can be off-putting to them and sometimes just giving down their initials and their dates of birth, I think there's a fear that someone somewhere is collating information on them. So the fact that sharing is often not so much a conscious decision to engage in risk behaviour, but more a consequence of where people live and the situations they find themselves in, means that tackling environmental risk is much more difficult. Because it's not just about giving drug users information, it's about making sure they have enough injecting equipment where and when they need it. Then we've got the issues where sharing is carried out as part of a relationship. Perhaps friends who go together to buy been sharing drugs together for a long time. They trust each other, they make assumptions that somebody else does not have a virus and they're willing to share in those circumstances. If they're throwing in with someone to buy the drugs, it's easier to just let someone take over and do that. What this means is that as well as making sure people know about the risks involved in sharing injecting equipment, we also have to understand who they share with and why and work with them to develop strategies so that not sharing, even in high-risk situations, becomes the norm. Perhaps the most difficult one to really address is the much wider and deeper marginalisation of a large portion of drug injectors in the UK. And I think when people end up marginalised, they're very disempowered in terms of taking control of protecting themselves from infection. And then fourthly, there's the role of the drugs themselves. With the increase of crack cocaine use, we are seeing a big impact on blood-borne virus transmission. Most people are polydrug users and most people in that polydrug use are using heroin and crack cocaine 
and then when we're asking them about that they're injecting them together often in the groin speedballing and injecting much more frequently than previously we were taking into account the more binge type nature of stimulant injecting can lead to situations where over time carelessness can creep in or people run out of needle syringes because they're just injecting more times than they had clean needle syringes for. People injecting crack cocaine do seem to inject more frequently and therefore would need much larger amounts of equipment. There's also evidence to suggest that their injecting practices generally tend to be more chaotic and so they may be at greater risk anyway. It's essential that needle exchange services respond to this change in use, this more frequent injecting and do not ration supplies of paraphernalia. Thanks very much. All right, lads. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks. So what this means is when people come in and you're trying to work out with them how much equipment they're going to need, it's not just a question of how many times a day they inject and how long it's going to be before they can get back to the needle exchange. It's also talking to them about how many needles and syringes they might give to friends and how often needles could get blunted through repeated attempts to find a vein and making sure they've got enough equipment so they can have emergency supplies at home and perhaps also with friends and family so that whatever situation they find themselves in, they can always get hold of a clean needle and syringe. People who would otherwise not engage in risk behaviour may find themselves engaged in needle and syringe sharing when they're withdrawing. Even though they don't want to, the withdrawal is, seems to be the precipitator that can actually lead to that risk event. If they want to hit or caution, it gets thrown to the wind and it's not always easy to have access to needles at night or over weekend. For heroin users, a prescription for methadone or buprenorphine can completely remove this driver of withdrawals for both sharing and injecting. And we'll come back to the importance of substitute prescribing in the prevention of bloodborne virus epidemics later. But first, one of the issues all the experts we spoke to talked about was the importance of understanding networks in the spread of bloodborne viruses. Because the bigger a network of injectors who are sharing, the greater the chances that one of them will have a bloodborne virus that can spread to the whole group. The bigger a network somebody is part of, the greater risk they're at. If an infection moves into a network that currently appears to have no infection within it, potentially infection can spread very, very rapidly within that network. The more closed the network is and the more stable the network is, the less likely infection is going to um, transmit as quickly. Of course, one of the huge risks for injectors who share a needle and syringe is that there is around a one in two chance that it will be infected with hepatitis C. And yet there's only around a one or two in a hundred chance that it will be infected with HIV. And it's only in recent years that we've begun to fully understand the reasons for this huge disparity in the prevalence of the two bloodborne viruses. HIV prevalence is lower than hepatitis C prevalence for several reasons. HIV was introduced in 1980s, took off in some populations but not in others, but before that there wasn't very much, there was no HIV in injectors. The other reason is because hepatitis C is easier to catch. Hepatitis C is, is more infectious by about tenfold than HIV because there's simply more hepatitis C virus in any given amount of blood than there is HIV. The longer someone's been injecting, the more times they will have injected, the more times there will have been events when they might have shared injecting equipment and so have been exposed to hepatitis C. In many cities, it is at such a high level, one in two injecting drug users are infected with hepatitis C. You only need small lapses in behaviour to sustain that epidemic. One of the things that's become clear in recent years is that hepatitis C prevalence isn't uniform across the country and there are large regional variations. When we look at the prevalences of bloodborne viruses across uh, the UK and across Europe, we see consistently the United Kingdom comes out as a low prevalence area. Interestingly enough, within the United Kingdom, we see really some quite large and, and, and marked variation the prevalence of hepatitis C infection varies markedly across the country. In London and the northwest of England, around two in three injecting drug users have antibodies to hepatitis C infection. However, in other parts of the country, particularly parts of the Midlands and the northeast of England, only around one in five 
have hepatitis C infection. The majority of drug injectors are, are living in the many, many smaller towns and cities across the United Kingdom. And actually some of these lower prevalence areas may be uh, more reflective of the much wider picture in the drug injecting population. It's notable that the populations that have a high prevalence of hepatitis C in the UK are the urban cities, those that probably had injecting populations around for longer. So although you've got rural populations that have got low hep C prevalence, it might be that they're just doing catch up. So in those scenarios, we've got a huge, a huge amount to gain for preventing infection. It's not too late to prevent infection. Unless a change in intervention coverage is achieved in 10 years time, they'll be as high as the other cities. Because if you look at their injecting risk behaviour, there's very little difference between injectors in South Wales and injectors in Manchester or Liverpool. So the cause of these areas of high hepatitis C prevalence is likely to be the length of time that injecting has been common in those areas, but also perhaps because networks in cities may be less stable. What it means is that we need good quality services in the high prevalence areas because sharing injecting equipment there is just so risky. But we also need good quality services in the low prevalence areas because it's likely that without reductions in sharing they will soon catch the high prevalence areas. Services need to be responsive to this with their harm reduction messages and not just asking people whether they've ever shared but really going into absolute detail of what they mean by sharing. At the same time, offering them bloodborne virus screening. There's a lot of undiagnosed infection throughout the UK for which there is treatment available, an effective treatment. If you don't know you've got hepatitis C, you put other people at risk, you put your own liver at risk, and you can't get treatment. Really important that we empower people, give them the information they need, and tell them about their infection. And most importantly, that after a diagnosis, there's a robust care pathway that ensures that they get the clinical follow-up they need. One of the things we've learned over the last few years is that drug users cope with treatment very well. If we offer treatment to people who are injecting drugs, they take advantage of the offer and they respond the same way that other people do. The National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which is the UK body that looks at whether treatments are worthwhile, investigated this area. They looked into treating injecting drug users and their conclusion was that active injectors should not be denied treatment. So there's no reason, there's no excuse for not testing people. We must make sure people get tested and help them to help themselves. In addition to giving drug users information so they can make informed decisions about protecting themselves, the two main tools we have to prevent new HIV and hepatitis C infections are substitute prescribing and needle exchange. Needle exchange is important because hepatitis C, HIV, hepatitis B are transmitted through the sharing of syringes. Without this central pillar of arm reduction, it's inevitable that we're going to see an increase in bloodborne viral prevalences and actually in a lot of other associated infection, bacterial infections as well. We need needle exchanges to help stop the spread of bloodborne viruses and to help stop the spread of infection. And it's essential that there's a needle exchange in order to have any impact on infection. And one of the main challenges is to get enough injecting equipment out there, particularly to people who are unable or unwilling to use services, and whose only source of equipment is people who are in contact with needle exchange an essential source of equipment supply known as secondary exchange. We should not view injecting drug use population as one homogeneous population. There's a wide range of needs, a wide range of people out there. And it's important to have different options for people to get hold of clean needles and syringes. I feel secondary needle exchange is really important within communities of injectors. We found 18% of our study population were getting their needle syringes from neither pharmacy nor from a drug service exchange. They were getting them from other individuals. Those people are a, a local resource. They're open all hours. They know the service users well. They have street knowledge. They know what's happening with the drugs that are on the streets at the moment. I think they are a resource that we could use, yeah, yeah. we could make much better use of. Um, to give peer education and harm reduction messages out and support them to continue doing what they're doing unofficially anyway. It's very important that 
that, that, that we do allow secondary exchange but at the same time that it's, it's combined with encouragement to get these people actually in. I do think a lot of people wonder if injectors worry about bloodborne viruses and of course they do. No one wants to catch a bloodborne virus. And although many of them are much more aware of the obvious routes of transmission, such as sharing needles or sharing spoons, I don't think they are as aware of the other routes, such as sharing water. Clearly, in terms of sharing risk, needles and syringes are much more dangerous than other items of injecting paraphernalia because there's more blood in a syringe and it's contained in a protected environment. But there are particles of blood on filters and spoons and in water, and people share these items more often than they do needles and syringes. So although the level of risk is lower, people may be exposed to it more often. We can't be too sure what the relative role of paraphernalia versus needle syringes sharing is. What we can be completely important, sure about is needle syringes are incredibly important and it seems rational to assume that paraphernalia could play a role because paraphernalia sharing is relatively frequent. So we should be looking at trying to reduce both of these risk behaviours. We know that the more often people inject and the longer they inject for, the more likely they are to be exposed to a bloodborne virus. And the best way of helping prevent people from catching HIV and hepatitis C is to help them stop or reduce their injecting. And for opiate dependent injectors, the best way to do this is to offer them a substitute prescription. The role of needle syringe change programmes has to go hand in hand with the other key components of reducing infection. Two ways that you intervene against bloodborne viruses is through promoting safer injection and providing sterile equipment and reducing injecting frequency by taking people and putting them on opiate substitution treatment. You can educate them and you can inspire them and you can, you know, you can take them into a community. And I mean, all those things are true. You can do that and it does work for some people. But for most people, the single quick fix that you can do is give them an alternative to their drug and immediately you take away the danger. Thank you. Bye-bye. Without engaging our service users rapidly with a substitute treatment such as methadone or buprenorphine, our patients are going to continue to use whatever they were using on the street in the same way as they were using. Opiate substitution treatment is very important for other two other reasons, which makes it cost effective as well, which is to reduce opiate overdose and also to reduce crime associated with drug use. Methadone is not a panacea. I mean, methadone is not something that is a cure. What we're doing here is treating a condition that's a chronic condition and has to be a maintenance treatment. Getting people onto adequate doses fast, and by adequate I mean doses that people are comfortable on from the moment they take it to the moment they take it the next day is, is, is crucial and fundamental. The addiction situation is still going on. People are still exposed to illegal drugs. Um, and they're likely to use illegal drugs, in my view. But it happens less if they're on methadone, and progressively it happens less. The longer people are on methadone, the less likely they are to inject. When our patients are using on top of their prescribed medication, then it should be a conversation. And the conversation should be around, why are you doing this? Double checking, are they comfortable? Or are they just hanging on by their fingernails? If they hang on by their fingernails because the dose isn't quite right, then the answer's an increase in the dose. It's not just about legal exchange programmes or about open substitution treatment, it's about both of them. Drug treatment services have a very important role to play in seeing the very vulnerable section of the injecting population. And there's an opportunity for education there that really shouldn't be missed. They've got to see themselves as part of a comprehensive intervention. They're not standalone interventions. Needle exchanges need to refer people into opiate substitution treatment as a priority to get people off injection. Opiate substitution treatment need to provide syringes to people on OST, and if people drop out, they need to find them and get them into needle exchanges and ideally back into OST. The challenge is that we need to provide probably more services than we have already, since hepatitis C is not going down, if anything, it's going up in the UK. But we need to provide more services at the same time collaborate together in order to provide the evidence that this ha is having an impact, that we do have evidence of an intervention effect. 
So to keep sharing frequency below the levels at which an HIV epidemic could be triggered and to start to reduce the number of injectors that catch hepatitis C, both the NICE guidance and the ACMD report recommend this combination of services, good quality substitute prescribing and needle and syringe programs that deliver adequate quantities of sterile injecting equipment where and when it's needed.